Hey guys, this is Jennifer from The Shooter's Mindset. We are live with episode 376. We have our co-host here, Greg Cannon. How's it going? Hey everyone. And our guest of the hour tonight, I don't know if anyone will recognize him. He's missing a little something. I think his face feels lighter. Uh, we got Joe Burdick with us, uh, the match director for the Vortex Team Sniper Challenge series. How's it going, Joe? Good, good. Hope you guys are well. Greg looks yeah. like he... Uh, he found what I cut off. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we logged on and I was like, you cut your beard off. It's like gone. It, for anybody that didn't know, Joe had a very long beard. So uh, he, he's, he's got his summer cut now, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so for anybody, I know you've been on a couple of times um, to talk about the series, <clears throat> but for anybody that maybe didn't see or doesn't know who you are, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into all this? Yeah, so I'm Joe Burke. I'm the match director for the Vortex Team uh, Sniper Challenge. And uh, we've actually made it a series this year. So uh, four, four qualifier matches and a championship. Um, I got into shooting um, once I started. Uh, I changed careers and started making a little more money and had a little more disposable income. So I started buying some guns. I'd always hunted and, and shot a little bit. Uh, just, you know cans and paper and so the the bug bit me to start shooting pistols and then I graduated from pistols to rifles and then rifles to shotguns and so pretty much every shooting sport discipline except the F class stuff and the national match stuff uh, I, I did and just kind of gravitated towards the precision rifle and found uh, the sniper challenge kind of match the the two gun stuff and that just kind of became the focus and shot a few of those and thought hey I think I might be able to do this too and so we put together a put together a match and it worked out pretty well and so we're started our fifth year out with uh, a, a five match series that's right so you've had like one or two a year right previously uh, always, always one um, started out uh, in South Carolina for the first one and then uh, went to Georgia for the second one and then came to North Carolina kind of by accident when when the venue in Kentucky closed down and then just have been in North Carolina ever since. Uh, it worked out good. It's just 13 miles from my house. So, so this year y'all decided to do an entire series um, which is nice, I think, because it's given, we're going to talk about some of the locations in a, in a little bit, but it, it's kind of spreading them out. So people that are on the West Coast or, um, you know, middle of the country are getting to enjoy match without having to drive completely cross country. So I think that's good that y'all strategically did the series to where everybody can be a part. It, it wasn't like, oh, it's a series and it's all in the Southeast. So I think that's really cool that it's given that opportunity to kind yeah, of it was a, all, all it took was a 6,800 mile road trip. <laughs> that's drove, right. Drove all around looking for, looking for places. And uh, we just kind of focused on the places that already had kind of a, a, a committed precision rifle community and uh, found a place in the Midwest. And, you know, we've, we've got plenty in the Southeast, obviously. Um, <clears throat> But we found a place in the Midwest, and then there's a couple out, uh, a couple out west, and then a championship down in Texas to kind of, kind of equidistant from all the other matches. <clears throat> so, so for anybody that doesn't know, can you kind of tell them what VTSC is? <clears throat> um, and you kind of said that y'all just kind of decided to to start it, but a little bit more about kind of how it got its start and grew into what it is now. Yeah, so I had, I had been and, and shot some of the other matches out there and, and thought, you know, this, this would be really fun um, to, to, to build one and do one. And there, there weren't very many. And I thought, you know, we, we, should, we should try to make this more real. Um, the first squad of guys I was on and the very first one I went to were all, you know, all of them had actually engaged people with a precision rifle. Um, <clears throat> in either law enforcement or a military setting. So, you know, they were like, yeah, you, this is, this is the way you would do it. So you kind of strive for realism and try to make it as, as real as we can make it without, you know, people shooting back at you. 
Um, so basically, it's a it's a uh, kind of a precision rifle match with some auxiliary pistol in there with it um, to kind of complement, kind of round out the the each stage. We try to have pistol on most all the stages, uh, <clears throat> but different than than NRL or PRS or F class or anything else. You're responsible for finding your own targets. Um, we don't we don't put them up against a berm with a placard behind them, or um, and they're not you know they're not painted. They're 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 all painted primer gray. If you if you want to know the truth, it's rust -Oleum. If you want to practice, it's rust -Oleum auto primer gray. Um, if you want to practice finding targets. They but, do not uh, gleam in the sun. They do not show up very easy. That gray kind of makes some uh, almost camouflage into whatever, like I would think, oh, gray, well, I'll be able to see that. You know, And you can, but it does kind of hide them. They kind of, that color kind of makes it a chameleon and it kind of blends into the shadows and it blends into, um, the trees, it blends into the dirt. Like it seems like it almost changed colors to match whatever it was next to. Um, it's a it's a good color for these matches because it's very difficult to they don't they don't shine out at you. Like yeah, white we, we started out the the first one, you know, everybody else's rifle targets were white. And I figured, you know, everybody will know kind of what to expect. We'll paint the targets white. Uh, if we're running five stages in a day, every squad gets to shoot on fresh paint. Every squad gets to shot on one gets to shoot on a one shot paint target, um, and then all the way through there until, you know, your last stage of the day has been shot four times before you. If there's five squads, so, you know, it's 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 kind of it's kind of even, it's kind of fair, but uh, this gray, this primer gray, um, I think the primer kind of bonds with the metal, and and even even when you shoot it, basically the more you shoot it, the more it looks the same. Um, so. There's no repainting and there's no big disadvantage from the first squad to the last squad of the day. Um, it's, it's, to, be, to be honest with you, um, you know, yes, the, the first squad of the day when all the targets are bright white, like that's going to be a lot easier. But I think that it actually makes your second, third, eighth, ninth, tenth stages of the day. Um, it actually makes it easier because it's a lot easier to see something that is a solid color versus even if the color is white or orange or yellow, if it's all shot up and you just see these little splotches and kind of like, you know, it looks like a rattle can camouflage job. I think the targets actually stand out better being painted gray at the beginning of the day towards the end of the day than if they were painted white to begin with. Yeah, yeah, there's. Uh, I see. I see exactly what you mean, and and you're exactly right. Um, we don't intentionally hide the targets, and uh, I, you know, we've, I've been to matches where they, you know, they paint them green and they paint stripes on them, and they they try to camouflage them. And uh, you know, when it all comes down to it, everybody wants to go to a, a rifle match because they want to shoot. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to a rifle match where you don't find a single target on a stage, uh, if you have four minutes or five minutes to look and you don't find any targets. And you don't get to shoot. People generally don't come back for that. Um, so trying to make a balance of <clears throat> not having these blazing white targets with a big placard next to them against the berm, um, and trying to balance that with uh, a target that's uh, not super super hard to find, but but not just put right out there, and, you know, and hidden behind something. You can do that find them it's not a matter of like they're so camouflaged you can't find them but with the I feel like you have to get on glass more it's not like you can stand there I mean I know with the white targets you can stand there and the way the sun hits them you'd be like there's one there and there's one there it, it forces you to kind of get on glass and look which I feel is more realistic to uh if you're wanting to have a sniper match that's more realistic right they're not going to get down and be like oh yeah there's somebody and, they're going to get on glass and make sure of their target. So I, right, right. I just like that it makes them get on glass. It's not quite as obvious as um, as having them painted bright white. Um, so I think it's I think it's good. But these so, matches are more realistic. Um, yeah, and that kind of goes that kind of goes that 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 goes with the with the whole theory behind making it more realistic is 
we don't hide targets, but we put targets in places where people would naturally gravitate to. So, you know, very rarely do you see one guy standing out there by himself. Oftentimes you'll see him, you know, standing next to vehicles um, or you know, you're kind of milling around, sitting around a campfire or um, taking a position up behind a berm and, and, you know, just kind of peeking your head up above it. We've put a, with, with obvious berms out there, long berms, um, <clears throat> we've put uh, 12 inch round circles with just a portion half sticking up. Like it would be if somebody were, if you're engaging <clears throat> an enemy force and, and they're taking cover behind something, you know, when they peek their head up, that's what you'd see. Or um, <clears throat> if there's a convoy of vehicles out there at a roadblock, you know, where people would be standing during a roadblock, you know, you'd have a guy by each door, uh, you know, kind of maintaining control. You'd have a guy up there at the front um, and then you'd have a guy kind of the back. And then there's always that one guy off kind of by himself. He's taking a leak or, you know, talking on the cell phone or something. And it, th those are your gimmies. So you got you got to take advantage of those, those guys that are standing out there in the in the open. Um, we don't get them very often, but 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 it happens. Uh, that, that would be me in this situation. I'd be the distraction. Yeah, so, there's, always, there's always that one guy, and he usually doesn't last long. So yeah, I'd be the one saying, "Oh, I'm sorry, I got distracted. It was a Chinook." <laughs> so these uh, matches have been going this season. We're really we wanted to do the show because we're kind of at the halfway mark, really. Um, so how has the season been going so far? How are the first two matches? So uh, good. Um, we had uh, we had the first one in North Carolina and uh, down here in this part of the area with our proximity to Fort Bragg and, you know, a lot of military bases and a lot of special operations stuff going on down here. The, the North Carolina match is really populated by uh, the heavy hitters. Um, perennial sniper match. Uh, rock stars basically um a lot of guys that that really hit it out of the park with this kind of match because we have so many of those guys in this area in the southeast so uh, we took the match to missouri um kind of that midwest you know you got a lot of hunters out there and a lot of guys that that uh that have an opportunity to shoot a long way due to the nature of the the terrain out there um there was a new a new venue and a new type of match uh, in that part of the country. So uh, we got a lot of uh, a lot of first time guys and we got a lot of repeat, you know, guys that have been coming to North Carolina. They're actually from Missouri. Um, so the the Missouri match didn't fill up, but um, I kind of didn't expect that it would. Uh, but I think we introduced a, a totally new sport to a, a whole new group of folks and got a, a ton of positive feedback. Uh, you know, when's the next one? When are you coming back? When are we going to do this again? Or, you know, so we'll, we'll definitely be looking to uh, bring a match back to the Midwest. Yeah, that, that was definitely fun to go out in Missouri. I enjoyed it. Um, oh, the land, was, the land was beautiful out there. Um, the weather was horrible, but I mean, you know, that's kind of the way it goes. Uh, that's the first time that we'd actually had a creek crossing, so that was good. At least at uh, 12 hours before that, the water was like chest high in that creek, so we were kind of anxiously trying to figure out if we were going to be able to make that happen or we were going to have to vehicle everybody across there. Um, but Bridge uh, building stage. <laughs> yeah, bridge building stage. Actually, there was a bridging unit there. Um, from the National Guard, and they were going to come and, and bring some vehicles, and uh, that was on our list of things. And at the last minute, they got pulled to somewhere in, to to build a bridge on the Arkansas River. So um, mm -hmm. we usually get a lot of a lot of good support from from National Guard, and you know they've provided vehicles and staff and things like that at a lot of these matches. So uh, yeah, we had some really good vehicles at this one. Yeah, and, we, and they were none of them. They were all private citizens that that had cool vehicles. We we had the National Guard scheduled to show, and and uh, it just wound up not happening kind of at the last minute. But you know, we had a, an old uh, an old Korean War era pickup truck that had been restored, and 
Um, we had the big flatbed with the with the crane on it, uh, big recovery vehicle. That was pretty neat. So yeah, a lot of a lot of cool stuff. The big five ton um, that came from a private citizen as well. So uh, we had some really neat vehicles. <laughs> the funniest thing about that one. So for anybody that wasn't there and doesn't know, so this thing is huge, right? And they had to crawl into it, and it wasn't like some of the deuces that you just like, oh, I got to like hoist myself up there. No, the tailgate was closed and you, they had some hay bales, which kind of led you around there thinking, oh, maybe that's the best way. And I don't think that was the best way. I think the best way was to climb up the tire, but it was so funny to watch some of the teams. They would like run over there, do the pistol. They turn around and they'd go, we're supposed to get in it. Like they'd be like, <laughs> you mean we're supposed to get in? And they're like, all right. And they start throwing their gear in and then trying to, you know, and some of them popped into there like it was nothing, but some of them literally stopped and looked like we're we have to get up in that. Like it was very, very funny to watch their faces on that. Yeah, Why going not? up the hay bales was definitely the hard way up, but there was a couple of guys that were just in such good shape that it was like top of the hay bales and then they're in the back of the truck somehow. So climbing up the wheel was definitely the, the easiest way to get in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I tried to go up the hay bales way, and we will not have videos of what it looked like. <laughs> it took about three people to get me in there, and I did not have gear. So, yeah. So, so the reaction um, of people stopping and trying to figure this out is kind of the cornerstone of the match. You get problems thrown at you that you don't get to see and look at before, you know, you get to hear about them during the stage brief, but the stage brief is not given at the stage. It is given in a holding area. And uh, you just gotta kind of use your imagination and, and pick up the clues that you can that are given in the stage brief. And then you solve those problems on the clock. So um, this is much, much more than just a raw marksmanship talent match. Um, there's a, a, a lot of, there's a lot of pistol in it and a lot of precision rifle guys aren't used to that. Um, and, but there's also a lot of, um, I won't say trickery, but, but real world things that throw you curveballs that you don't often see. Um, Hey, my, the RO stops us and my partner just got hit, uh, with fragments from a grenade. Um, he just lost his strong arm. So now I have to put a tourniquet on him. And we have to continue the stage with three arms instead of four. Um, but always, always some, some not tricks, but always some hurdles that you have to overcome uh, on the clock. And it's, and it's all real world stuff. It's not silly stuff. There's no uh, jiggly beds or what they, what they call the boat in, in some places where, you know, the, the uh, piece of plywood hanging on the chains and you're trying to, you know, none of that. This is, this would be what, what positions that snipers would take up and, and try to try to make the most stable position they can instead of being forced to shoot from the least stable position possible. Um, if you can figure it out, you know, as long as pretty much as, as if you can do it safely and you can solve these problems on the clock uh, and you and your partner can communicate well, you're going to do well. So do you have any uh, highlights or favorite stories or quotes from the first half of our season so far? Uh, most of the quotes that really stick out in my head are very humorous, um, but they are not, uh, the, they're usually laced with so much profanity that, that <laughs> <laughs> which tree? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and that, and that, and that one goes back, the brown one, yeah, they're all brown, um, with lots of expletives in there with it, um. But, you know, just the, the communication part is, is so much fun to watch. If you get a chance mm -hmm. to go out and watch, watch the stages, uh, some of these guys work together like, you know, like two well-oiled gears uh, meshing. Um, Odom and Gidcom, if you see those guys shoot, their communication <sighs> is so on point. And, and it's, it's, I think, it, honestly, I mean, they're both good shots. But I think it's honestly the reason, the way they communicate and the way they direct each other onto targets is, is one, I think the main reason that they are so successful. Um, you know, almost everybody has great gear. Um, almost everybody has a good foundation and in, 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 uh, precision rifle. Uh, but 
the guys that communicate well are the guys that do so well. So in uh, editing all of the videos there, you know, I got to go back and rewatch and rewatch and rewatch a bunch of stuff. Um, and there are a couple of good quotes that are appropriate to, to, to say. Um, and a lot of them, the, the funny thing is with, you know, in PRS, you're given a target order, you know, you're going to shoot the, you're going to shoot in a troop line, you're going to shoot 300, 400, 500, 600. In this, it's, you know, you're going to shoot the IP-6, you're going to shoot the, uh, the squares, and you're going to do it from the back of this truck, and also you got to shoot the pistol stuff first. So the, you don't have mind reading ROs, so you have to communicate to the ROs what target you're going to shoot. And the, the ROs out there were all really, really good about, you know, n having that course of fire memorized, knowing everything. But at that point in time, the RO generally knows more than the, than the shooter. Well, always knows more than the shooter. You know, they've spent all day looking at the same targets. So some of the funny ones from that is uh, there was one stage where you had to describe the, the shape and the color of the targets. And that's all it took. You know, you told the RO, "Hey, I'm shooting at a shooting at a brown square." Uh, one good quote from that is, "Round is not a color." Round is not a color. <laughs> from the RO, I'm shooting at the round circle. <laughs> round is not a color. Um, a little bit later, you hear, "You were right. This should not have been this hard." Um, there is one shooter that was calling out. You know, he's like. I'm on the target at 736 yards. And I was like, that, that will not work. I need, you know, orientation, what's near it, something. And finally, he's like, it's the one right over the creek or right over the water. He's like, okay. The guy shot three rounds at it all, went right over the top. Then his partner comes back and goes, oh, that was at, that was at 400 yards. And he goes, that's why I wouldn't take your, <laughs> that is an identifier. But the yeah, best one awesome. is with Kid Kim and Odom at the end of one stage. One of them calls for a time call and like in the coolest voice ever he goes three seconds. <laughs> they, they, they do amazingly well. Um, and, and they have a system that uh, this is the first time that I've ever actually watched them shoot um, more than once. And uh, they have a great system. You guys, if, if you're interested in doing this kind of match, uh, watch the videos from the shooter's mind mindset because they're there some of them are on there um of their system where they describe sectors for targets um you know i shoot these kind of matches every time i get a chance to and and we're i'm trying to figure out how to incorporate that same system and and, and copy their formula so um really great communication i think is the biggest thing that you can bring to this kind of match <laughs> So we're at the halfway mark because there's going to be four matches total. Well, five matches total, four regular matches, and then the finale, um, which people have to qualify for to get in. Um, but so two of the regular matches have occurred. And now y'all have registration opening for the third. So tell us about that one. So we're going to open registration for the third match, which is at uh, the Cameo Shooting and Education Center right outside of uh, Grand Junction, Colorado. So um, that's going to be the last day of September, uh, September 28th through October the 2nd. Um, and we're going to open registration for that uh, this coming Saturday morning at nine o'clock. So that's what I'm going to do right now is to get the word out so that if people want to uh, register for this, they can know that Saturday morning is when it's going to open. So Saturday at 9 a.m., the 21st of this month. And it's going to be beautiful. I've heard it. I, I'm excited to go out there. I think it's oh, it's an it's an incredible facility. Um, there's a huge bunch of infrastructure there for the, for this kind of match. Uh, well, for any kind of match, really, with uh, what they've got going on there, it's a it's a state funded um, project. So, you know, great infrastructure there. Uh, and then it's set in some of the most beautiful country around. It's that uh, mountainous, that arid. It's, it's on the western slope. So um, it's really, really super dry. Um, so you got that kind of mountain desert feel. Um, really, really super neat country. 
Um, and there's a, a pretty decent road system there. So it's gonna be a lot different than any of the ones that we've ever had. There's, there's not a whole lot of trees out there. So um, when you think about where people like to hide, um, it's going to take something away from you. There's no, there's no groves of trees to hide in. So, um, partially exposed targets are probably going to be kind of a big thing. Um, but yeah, cameo is going to be cameo is going to be fantastic. Um, I kind of grew up in Colorado on the on the other side of the mountains, but um, uh, I love going out there and and can't wait to get back out there. And I'll, I'll be going out a month early and. Um, working working on it out there i've got some of my core guys that come from north carolina with me uh and uh even from indiana so we're, we're gonna have a good time we're gonna put on a great match at it cameo um it's gonna be lots of great food um we're working on entertainment um but we'll like the the other matches that we've done you know we'll have a big meal for competitors and and guests um on our uh on our vendor day uh, so it'll be free food for everybody that wants to come and check out all the vendors and the sponsors. And um, we will uh, also do a big meal for competitors and staff and things after the match. So we're, we're trying to trying to fill in the, the, the Thursday with um, some, some fun stuff that maybe we haven't seen in any other matches. That's cool. And y'all do really try and make it into like an experience. Uh, a weekend, you know, so it's not just like go shoot the match and go back to your hotel. I think it's uh, fun that y'all do that and have different things. We're going to talk about some of the classes in a little bit, but um, but yeah, so I think it's good. So yeah, we want to we get the competitors out. Um, you know, everybody has to come in and, you know, kind of check in and everything. So we figure, you know, we, we want to get the competitors out and, uh, you know, get them fed and get them registered, get them zeroed. Um, have them uh, have a chance to, to interact with the, with the sponsors. And, uh, and we also want spectators to come um, for a couple of reasons. We want spectators to be able to interact with the sponsors and the sponsors um, get to promote their product with uh, maybe some, some new people, um, maybe you know, a, new, a, a new market, um, somebody that's not into precision rifle yet. Uh, maybe they can... Uh, sway some new interest there. And then, you know, we also want to get those people uh, to see what this kind of, this kind of match is all about and maybe get, you know, get them into it as well. So uh, we have the one in Cameo and then what's the final qualifying match? So the final qualifying match is, um, is going to be another spectacular uh, natural terrain match in the, the far southwestern corner of Utah. So down around Zion National Park is actually just 15 or 20 minutes from the gate to Zion National Park. So um, it's on a private ranch out there, um, you know, big canyon land type desert. And this is true desert. Um, Elevation is not as high as it is at, at Cameo. So different climate, you know, but, uh, you know, rocky red sandstone a lot of that um but it's incredible place incredible probably the prettiest place that we've ever done one of these um if you like that canyon land utah kind of feel um when i was out there before the uh the landowner you know we're out there doing the tour and he's like see that fence post there you know what that is and i was like no no what he's like that's arizona so we're all the way down in the corner um he said the he said my family used to own the other side um but uh, they lost it in a poker game, I think. <laughs> oh, wow. A bunch of land, yeah, a bunch of land there, but uh, lots of land out there, lots of acreage, um, some really cool places to shoot, um, some things that you won't get to see anywhere else in the country. Um, That's cool. But looking, looking super forward to doing that. Uh, and it's about a two and a half hour drive from Las Vegas. So Vegas would be the closest airport. Uh, St. George is a smaller airport, kind of like Grand Junction is to Colorado. It's, uh, but Vegas is the, 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 the best, the biggest airport close by. Maybe I'll get that uh, free rental car upgrade I got when I was there for SHOT Show. 
Yeah, there you go. That's the cheapest place <laughs> in the world to rent a car is Vegas. I I uh, won that one. I came down in the morning because uh, Sunday we we flew in, flew in a little bit early, and Sunday I was just going to go adventure out in the wilderness by myself. And I rented a small SUV, and I get down in the morning. And the guy's like, "How about a convertible Camaro?" And I'm like, "Yeah, all day." <laughs> yep, that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, um, we got a couple lives. Uh, first off, Chad Heckler said he got his RS3 cover a few weeks ago, and he's loving it. He needs to order a couple of more. Uh, tell us a bit about these. Tell us a little bit about these covers. Okay, um, they're basically a just kind of a little stretch cover that that goes over the top of your uh, goes over the top of your rifle. They're more designed for um, precision rifle match type shooting, where you're you know you're setting your rifle down on a bipod, um, kind of like on a line of rifles. There you just keeps the dirt keeps the dirt out keeps the dust out particularly important out there in Colorado and and uh, Utah but back here in the east it you know keeps the rain off of them um, and a lot of guys say you know oh your rifle's supposed to get wet if, if it won't get wet and that's they're kind of missing the point uh, if, if you have dry optics and a dry gun you have a competitive advantage so it's less about it's less about protecting the rifle uh, but keep it a little more hospitable to your hands and your eyes, you know, when the weather's bad. So they're all custom uh, for your rifle. So you send me the length and the color you want. Uh, we can have custom printed fabric done, but um, thanks a lot, Chad. Appreciate you ordering and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make you some up. Just let me know. The, the other thing Joe left out is they are probably the lightest ones on the market. Um, yeah, yeah, they don't weigh much. Um, I sourced the fabric from some guys here that uh, they're ultralight backpacking guys, and um, hmm. they started. You know, they they needed the fabric to do the same thing that uh, we needed them for. So, while they're good for PRS and stuff, where weight isn't such a such a big concern, they're they're even better if you're if you're standing around, you got to carry all that stuff. Yep. Um, and so if someone's interested in one of these rifle covers, where would they get it from? Uh, rocksolidshooting.com and just go under the, the rifle cover tab and uh, you can put your orders in. Uh, we've, we've had a little bit of problem, you know, with COVID and sourcing. I have a seamstress in town here that, that can knock them out as quick as we can get them. But just the, the tie up and fabric, especially the dyed fabrics are taking longer and longer um, as we go. But uh, I got a good supply of fabric on hand, especially if you like any of the normal colors, uh, the grays, the greens, the khakis, the tans. Um, if it's kind of an exotic color, you know, I've made a bunch of purple ones. And Jen was actually one of my very first customers. Um, she had a bright blue one that she wanted to match. I can't remember what it was. I think it was to match an MPA chassis or something. And uh, yep, we, yeah. we hooked her up. With, <laughs> we hooked her up. With, that's been like four or five years ago. We hooked her up with one that matched her chassis perfectly. So, um, and it's still in good shape. It still protects it, and it still works great. Well, good deal. I'm glad you like it. Let's say that's something that's been on my shopping list for four years since she got hers. Do you have any of that green in stock? That beautiful, bright, vibrant lime green. Um, I do have some drink. The, we, we got one recently. Uh, it's called Green Tea. And um, one, of the, one of the PRS guys wanted something a little different. So um, it's kind of a bright green. But we can get any color you want. Um, as, long as, as long as the company makes it in the waterproof fabric, we can get it. That's awesome. One, one of these days, I'm going to go all the way to the safe and measure the length of my rifle and get one. There of you go. Over. There you go. That's all I need is the is the muzzle to butt length. Um, if, you, if you're a rimfire guy or a bench rest shooter um, and you, you put it in there, the standard bottom opening in the covers is 40 inches. So a lot of those rifles are shorter than that and it just kind of looks like a taco. So if I get one that, that, that's, that's really short like that, I'll give, you, I'll give you a call or shoot you an email and we'll find out how big that bottom opening needs to be and for a, for a truly custom cover. Um, just so it's just not a big rectangle. So Chris Smith said Joe is doing a great job with Vortex Sniper matches. He has a ple pleasure of shooting with him around here a little in PRS. Keep up the good work, Joe. He's a stand-up guy. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. Chris, is, Chris has actually come out and helped set up some of the matches. So 
uh, he knows what goes into it. Um, so the finale, let's talk about that a little bit. So these qualifying matches are feeding the finale. So tell us a little bit about the championship itself and the qualifications. And I heard there might be some money. Yeah, there's, there's going to be a little money. Um, we, we, our sponsors have been so generous in, uh, in providing the cash that we are going to give back to the shooters. It's, it's just amazing. Um, but it breaks down like this, the, top five competitors or the top five teams in each of the three divisions. So we have a division that, that uh, rucks the whole course on timed movements and then camps on the course. Um, we have a division that rucks and does the time movements on the course, uh, but then gets released to go to a hotel. And then we have a division that just rides around and then they get to go to a hotel as well. They're not doing the rucks. So three divisions, the top five teams in each division at each qualifier match automatically qualifies for a slot in the championship. So theoretically, if all of the teams that made it, if all of the top five teams in the first two matches, the championship is halfway full. Um, now we do have some guys that are really kicking butt and uh, finishing in the top five in multiple matches. So that will open up a couple of slots because those guys can only take up one slot in the championship. And then we have some guys, you know, that can't make it. Uh, we got a lot of military and law enforcement that get deployed and, you know, have to do coverage for big events. So uh, sometimes some of our guys that, that finish up there close to the top aren't going to be able to make it. So uh, we've kind of come up with a formula as to who gets in um, after the after the offerings have been sent out to all of the uh, all of our top five finishers in each division at the qualifier matches. So we're going to start with um, those, those guys are automatically already in. Um, after that, when, when we, when we've heard from all of them that are going to be able to make it either yay or nay, uh, we'll open that up to members that have shot members of teams that have finished in the top five but their partner can't make it. So, you know, if me and my partner finish third in, in Missouri uh, and my partner gets deployed or something, then uh, we'll open those slots up for a brief period of time, you know, for a few days for those guys that, that qualified, basically half a team. And then from there, we'll go, when, when we've heard from all of those folks, uh, we'll give them a few days. And then when we've heard from all those folks, we'll go to uh, teams that have shot the match in the past. So maybe, maybe you were sixth or, or seventh or, you know, just liked it enough that you want to come shoot another one. Um, we'll open that up for, for prior contestants of any of the qualifiers. And then when we've heard from those folks, uh, if we don't, you know, if, if there's still slots left after that, then we'll open it up to um, the dark horse teams, the general public. So there's still a chance to get in if, if you, if you can, but I think those slots at the championship are going to go pretty quick, uh, considering the the prize tables and the the um, the cash payout that we're going to do. Yeah. The midpoint. Yep. So we're we're about at the point of the show. Remember, if you're watching us live on Facebook, ask any questions you may have here in the comments section of the video, and we'll ask it live on air. Other ways to catch us, you can always check back on the TSM Facebook page. The videos stay up there forever. We usually upload all the podcasts um, the night after on all the different podcast apps. So if you want to take us on a, on a trip or a road trip, uh, or even while you're working, we're on all of those. And then finally, everything will be uploaded to the Shooter's Mindset YouTube page. So if you're wanting to look back and, you know, we're on episode, what, 376 right now. So there's 375, 374 uh, episodes posted up there for your viewing pleasure. That's fun. So I think this finale is going to be a lot of fun. I think it's going to be neat to see all the teams because um, we had a different group of people in Missouri than North Carolina. So I think it'll be fun to see all of them go head to head. 
Oh yeah. Well, I, I saw some guys shoot there uh, in Missouri that had no experience doing this kind of thing. It was their first match of this type at all. And they just absolutely demolished the stage. Uh, I was, I was just kind of awestruck. I was like, wow, I made this way too easy. And then I watched a few of the teams after them shoot and, and they struggled. And I was like, man, those guys are really just that good. Um, no experience doing this, no military experience at all. Um, a couple of hunters uh, from Missouri and they just absolutely crushed it. So um, this, this isn't just for military and law enforcement guys. There's a lot of guys out there that, that have a good base and, and, and just kind of think through problems. And you don't even need to be old enough to run. No, we had two 15 year old guys there qualify for the championship in their first match of this kind. Um, uh, both, both three gun guys um, and, and just super good kids, super respectful, great to be around. Um, really, really hanging out with those guys really gives you uh, hope for where the shooting sports are going. Um, if we can keep attracting people like those kids. Um, fantastic, fantastic shooters and just such great attitudes um, through the whole thing. I think qualified for the championship on their first their first run. So um, I can't wait to see them in Texas. I know they'll be there. They were very excited to be there and to compete. And um, yeah, I, I, I don't know that I've seen competitors as excited as they were just to be there. Like they said, we're just gonna go slow, try and you know, get some points on there. And I think that it worked well for them because they did communicate well and they, they did a good job. Yeah, and they're uh, they're still excited about it. I, um, Evan was messaging me earlier today. Um, looks like they're gearing up, making some changes um, and getting ready for the finale. So well, hopefully they don't do hopefully they don't change too much. They did they did really, really well. Um they they you know they beat a lot of beat a lot of really good teams um at, at their in their first outing. So I was super, super impressed with those guys. Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, Evan put up a video on his Facebook of kind of an overview of the match and uh some changes he was making. He changed backpacks and tripod and saved 10 pounds. Oh yeah, yeah. Which uh, is a lot, huge. In oh yeah, a lot of the military style backpacks are are they're absolutely indestructible, um, but they're heavy. And when it mm -hmm. when they get wet, they get even heavier. Mm -hmm. And um, so far, I think every one of these we've run, all the the first five, and then uh, both of them this year, uh, there has been rain at almost every one of them. So everything's going to get wet. And just about every one of these matches that I've ever shot uh, outside of this has, there has always been some rain. So uh, think about how much, think about how much uh, weight your pack's going to gain when it gets wet. So the, the mountaineering and the, the, the ultralight backpacking guys have got it figured out. Uh, it's just a lot of times it's just a durability issue and a way to carry a rifle on a, on a pack like that. Yeah, I think the uh, it, it seems like he's got something that's gonna save him a ton of weight and still be rugged enough to to make it through. So that's good for them. So there's many key skills involved to compete in a team sniper challenge. Um, you know, you got communication and teamwork kind of being top. Um, you have organization, target identification and ranging, time management, gear prep, and more. What do you think will be the most important skill set to have at Cameo? Uh, I would probably say conditioning is going to be huge for Cameo. Um, the, you know, it's a little bit higher elevation. So, you know, ideally we'll attract a lot of shooters from out West and they'll do really well, but uh, there is a good bit of elevation there. Um, it's not super, super high, but um, you will notice it if you come from the East coast. Um, and hydration uh you're gonna have now we provide water at all the stages and all that stuff but uh we can we can get it there for you and and have it available but you're gonna have to drink it there 
Um, it's going to be you know, ideally the weather will be good, uh, even though it's in that part of the year. And you think about Colorado being cold, it's on the western slope, and the weather's usually pretty good that time. But it's dry; it's very, very dry. So you're going to have to stay hydrated. Um, you know, one of the big things that you start you start losing focus. It's easy to lose focus when you get uh, when you start to get dehydrated. So um, staying hydrated, um, you know, being being in decent shape. Uh, if you're in one of the divisions where you have to have to do the time drugs, but uh, like all the rest of them, I think, um, you know, like you said, communication and organization, and um, that's going to be huge for all of these, but uh, you'll have some extra things to think about with the elevation and the, and the arid nature of this kind of this place. So it's beautiful, but uh, I wouldn't say it's hostile, but it, it's, uh, you know, it's it's not your average, it's not your average venue. <laughs> With all that beauty comes that uh, that altitude and that that dryness. So, um, other than that, I think um, finding targets uh, may be a little more difficult. But then again, it may be a little bit easier. It's you know, it's really kind of hard to tell till you get them out there and you start looking. You know, is it is it easier to hide in a in a rocky desert environment or is it easier to hide in the forest. Um, we're going to keep the, we're going to keep the targets the same color and it, and it probably matches the color at Cameo a little bit better than it does in the woods, but um, target identification will be a, it'll be a big one as well. Um, the good thing though is you won't have as much, uh, there won't be as much vegetation and things in the way uh, to, to kind of throw a curve in your ranging game either. So uh, a lot of, you know, you have a lot of problem in some of these wooded matches where you get a little tough to grass 100 yards short of the target and your, you know, your range is, is off by 100 yards. So hopefully we won't have as many problems with that as you do uh, in, a, in a forested match. Uh, but it's, you know, all these matches have their own challenges. And that's that's kind of one of the things that that really makes it cool is that you go from, you know, shooting in a pine forest to shooting in the desert, shooting in the mountains and, and just try to make it real. You know, where are all the places that guys deploy? Um, we've spent the last 20 some years uh, in a couple of different deserts in, in rocky terrain, very similar to what you're gonna see at Cameo and in and, and some places in, in Utah. So um, this is all as realistic as we can make it. So, so for target identification, when you, get up to a stage let's assume we're in cameo and you know you get on your binos what are you looking for to to find those targets fast are you first and foremost i'm looking at uh i'm looking for straight edges uh, there aren't a whole lot of straight lines in nature um, and especially out there in the rocks you know you got all those boulders are kind of around a circle is going to be much harder to find i think a cameo than uh, than a torso shaped target or a square or a diamond just because you have those straight edges and then they're all on T posts. Um, all of our, you know, all of our targets mount on a T post. So um, that T post is kind of a, not a giveaway, but it's a, it's a target, a target indicator. Um, but, you know, a lot of straight edges, uh, a lot of um, a homogenous surface or something that's flat that kind of, that, that takes that, that shape or that reflection, whereas a, a rock is going to be round and have more than more, be more dimensional. Um, I think those two are going to be the, the biggest things. And then don't forget, you know, we put targets where people would gravitate to. So, um, you know, like I said, I'm not going to hide them behind a rock. Uh, but if, if there's a if there's a line of rocks that that you think that there might be uh, an advantageous point. So, uh, you know, if you're going to, you're going to try to get elevation on somebody that you're, that you're trying to, to war against, um, there's going to be a lot of opportunities to look up and, uh, to find places where people would hide. Um, it's not necessarily a counter sniper match, uh, where a sniper would be looking for you, but, um, it's where you would be looking for targets. So generally, if you're out there and, and in an environment like that, you've been in the woods for a couple of days looking around, and all of a sudden you come up on vehicles, um, hey, there's vehicles there. There's probably people around the vehicles. Let's, let's see what's going on. Um, 
same thing with aircraft. We've had we've had aircraft uh, airframes out on the on the firing line before. Uh, we've shot from them. Um, but thing places that you would would gravitate to if you were uh, deployed and in a in a combat situation. So um, that's another another key to, to places to look for. They're not going to stand out in the open. So if you see a if you see a tree line or or something like that, you know you, you want to start looking along that tree line. That makes sense. And uh, in watching some of some different people shoot your stages and seeing where you do place targets. Um, when you first told me, you know, when we first showed up to the first match, you kind of told us a little bit about that, you know, all the targets are in where the people would be. And it really is true. You know, it's like, oh, there's a, there's a target on this road. Oh, look, you go up the road another 20 feet. There's another target. Oh, look, you go up the road again. Oh, look, there's this like overlooking edge here that's hanging out. There's a guy there. They're not yeah, like he- behind a tree. Yeah, people are people are generally kind of lazy, and if there's a road, they're going to walk down the road most of the time, unless they're, you know, unless they're directed otherwise. Um, animals do the same thing; they walk along game trails. Uh, if you can find a game trail, you can usually find game. That's why the trail's there. So, people people do the same thing, um, and 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 that's where that's where you'll find the targets uh, in the same same spots. So when you shoot these matches. Do you have kind of a, a, I know we've talked to some teams that do this where they have a calorie intake plan and a hydration plan where it's okay, you know, we're shooting this many stages on this day. We have this for the first stage, this for the second stage. We have to make sure we drink this much by this time. Uh, we don't plan that out for the contestants. Um, no, no as, I, as a shooter. Oh, yeah. as a so So my partner and I, you know, we 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 shoot these matches every year, and uh, we have it planned out to the absolute nth degree about how many calories we're going to take in. And you always like to have a little bit extra, but you don't you know you don't want to be carried around a bunch of stuff that you're not going to use. Um, how much fuel do we have? You know, we switched fuel canisters at the last minute uh, this past year and uh, went to half as much fuel and still had fuel left over. So uh, you try to make everything as light as you can. Um, you know, everybody, it's, it's doable to carry a heavy rucksack. Um, I could add 10 pounds to my rucksack and still make all the rucks. But then you start adding that fatigue, how much that takes out of you. Um, so when you, get to the, you, when you get to the stage, you're less tired, you make better decisions, you think more clearly, uh, the less fatigue you are. Because fatigue is a big thing in these matches. So yeah, we we absolutely want to you absolutely want to try to plan out um, your your calorie intake and think about how many calories you're going to burn doing this stuff. I mean, you know, some depending on how much you're carrying and how far you're going, you know, you can burn thirty thousand calories, forty thousand calories in a weekend. Um, you can't possibly eat that much um, and and carry it all. But so you you need to put a lot of thought into what type of food you're bringing. Um, and and bring as much of it as you can as you can eat. And can, that was the I mean, I was gonna say can. yeah. I mean, I can eat forty thousand calories. I just can't carry forty thousand calories. Yeah, it gets to be uh, prohibitive when you're having to carry it all. It does it does there, you have to weigh the you know the pros and the cons to it. Yeah, and the same, you know, the same holds true for your ammunition. Um, you're you're going to carry, you know, everybody would like to have as much ammunition as you can carry, but um, you're you're not going to use it all. But you know, the only way to score points is to is to hit targets. So you got to have enough to you got to have enough to get it done, but you don't want to carry twice as much as you need. So those calculations are one of the things that make this match so much fun. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's it's there's so much more to it than just the shooting. So, you know, you don't have to be a, a world-class marksman or a, or a world-class, um, a world-class athlete, but to, to be able to combine a bunch of those skills, good observation, good communication, uh, decent fitness, uh, decent, uh, decent marksmanship skills, um, and good problem solving skills will take you a long way in this, in this type of competition. 
So, um, of skill, because um, I do think that doing these matches takes a whole new skill set. It's not just um, shooting. You could go out and practice shooting for forever and still not do well in this match if you don't know absolutely how to pack, how to eat, um, how to communicate with your partner, how to range, how to find targets. Like all of those things are are big things. So. Um, Y'all try and offer some classes. So I know Vortex is obviously, it's the Vortex Team Sniper Challenge. They're a huge sponsor of this. And so they um, they are there all the time and they're teaching some classes on the range finders. What other classes do y'all have there? Um, so we, we do a, the Stop the Bleed class, which uh, you're familiar with the instructor there. Um, <laughs> I heard she's not that great. Yeah, she's, uh, no, she's pretty she's, bad. She's awesome. She's awesome. She's um, running away. Yeah, she kind of disappeared on us. Um, so Jen teaches the Stop the Bleed classes. Um, we developed a thing this year. Uh, if you have a tourniquet on your person during the stage um, and you, you carry that through the entire match, then you can add points to your final score. So... A team can score two points, not hit a target uh, all weekend, and still still score some points by having a tourniquet on hand. Um, and rather than just have everybody have one and not know how to use it, um, we we usually have uh, three three or four classes uh, on that Thursday on how to use it and, and how to um, how to carry it and store it and and use it when you need to. So. Um, we try to we try to throw that in into the match and you know you never know you may you may have to use one during a match um, on the clock uh, as part of the stage so, uh, so that's something that we do here and and just to revisit vortex's uh, classes um, I had no idea that uh, when I first started this that the, the little reticle in your rangefinder um, that there were places on that reticle that are a little bit better for ranging than others so um, they'll teach you all the little tricks and tips to get the most out of that range finder because uh, there's you know you can you can kind of fine tune them a little bit and uh, use them in some alternate ways and and teach you some strategies on using a range finder um, on on natural terrain that 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 will really really help you out so i highly recommend the vortex classes um, and I, I definitely highly recommend the uh, stop the bleed classes. Um, so even if you know, even if you know how to use it, even if you have the tourniquet with you, if you don't know how to use it during the match, you know that might come back and bite you in the butt because <laughs> you might be required. Uh, that RO may want to do that two finger test and see if he can get two fingers under there. If he can get two fingers under there, you might not have it tight enough, <laughs> or you might have it too tight. Um, you don't want your you don't want your partner. You want your partner to be able to still shoot. It is a simulation. Uh, we're not trying to completely cut the blood flow off, but you do need to know how to use one. You do need to carry one. Um, you need to have them in your car. You need to have them in your person. Um, on your person. Uh, and you definitely Sorry, need to I have one. Like because somebody came to my door, but. Uh, I agree completely and like my kids give me a hard time because they're like mom you're that mom that made us carry one in high school but I taught my kids how to place a tourniquet and they still have them in their backpacks um, so yeah they uh, definitely I'm not sure what y'all are talking about in the chat because I missed some of that but it is, it is entirely inappropriate <laughs> <laughs> but I'm it like, is funny I'm, I'm not reading that I'm not sure what it was but <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, interesting. But yeah, I think it's something that everybody should have. I mean, anymore, there's different shootings going on every week. It seems like grocery stores, churches, um, and having that really can save your life. I, I'm a trauma nurse and have seen multiple people saved by tourniquets. So I'm a big advocate for them, obviously. That's why I teach the classes. But um, yeah, I definitely think it's a good thing to have. And it's such a cheap thing. I mean, they're 25 bucks off of Amazon. And then you have tourniquet. So, I, I guarantee you, by the end of the year, we will have a story come back from somebody that shot one of these matches that saved somebody's life with a tourniquet. Uh, it, it, it probably won't be a shooting. 
Um, but you know, people people have bad, you know, axe accidents, saw accidents, construction accidents. Um, I I promise somebody will have saved somebody by the end of the year. Well, and I tell the um, students when I teach that that. Uh, in all my trauma, I've seen it used for gunshot wounds, but what I've seen even more prevalent is um, farming accidents. We have rural areas that get flown into my hospital, and um, we've seen a lot of, you know, amputations, things, horrible injuries from, um, from farming accidents, because they have a lot of equipment that, like, don't ever get on a farmer's bad list because I'm convinced that they can like kill you and no one will ever find you. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, like Carol Baskin's husband. Yeah, but um, but yeah, that and like even car accidents, motorcycle accidents, there's been a lot of tourniquet use for those. So it's absolutely just, just a great skill to have. I think everybody should know how to use them appropriately. So. Did we talk about the other classes or just that? I'm sorry. So I think we're, I think we've got, I think we've got uh, Hill People Gear um, are going to do a, a class, uh, have multiple classes um, on uh, load carriage. So, you know, they make some fantastic uh, backpacks and chest packs and chest rigs. And um, I realize I've been cobbling together stuff for years and, uh, once I saw their stuff, putting it out on the prize table, I was like, man, I've been doing this all wrong. So they're going to teach some classes on load carriage, um, which is a kind of a science all to itself. Uh, once you carry a rucksack for, you know, 30 or 40 miles on a weekend full of stuff, um, you will understand. <laughs> so hopefully they're going to make a bunch of people's lives easier um, with what they can learn there. And then uh, I know applied ballistics is going to be at the finale um, with some with some high-end folks there to, to answer some questions and and uh, teach some classes on some gear there as well. So, uh, and we've, you know, we've got people that step up and say, hey, you know, can we can we come and do, can we come and teach a class on this? And so the, the schedule's kind of fluid. Um, you know, we may we may have some more folks come in and, and do some more things, but um, our, our cornerstone and our dependable ones so far have been um, the Stop the Bleed and uh, Vortex with their, with their getting the most out of your laser range finder, so. And how about uh, expert wind training in Missouri? Oh, that was, I would love to have that one back. Uh, you know, Eamon Praslick came from, uh, from up north and came down and did a, did a wind reading class there. And, you know, that's, that's normally a, an expensive class um, to, to attend. And it, you know, I only got five minutes of it because I was running around, you know, trying to get, trying to get, you know, direct the troops to get places, get people where they needed to be. But just the very minimal part of what I got to listen to was absolutely fantastic. And um, uh, I wish we could get them back and, and, and do some more of those. That would be great. Um, but great class. I heard nothing but great things about that. You know, people come up to me and are like, Man, thank you so much for having these these extra opportunities to to learn and and you know you know we had a bunch of demo stuff at, at a lot of our a lot of our uh, events so you know we're going to try to maximize the the sponsorship presence from a physical point of view where they come and and bring product and and bring resources and uh, bring knowledge hopefully at a lot of these. Uh, yeah, the uh, the classes are really, really cool. Like Amos class, I've taken that three times and I learned it was the same exact class and I continue to learn stuff every single time I take it. That man is just pure genius. But sometimes yeah. even just having having people on site, whether it's an, an OEM, you know, getting to get to talk with these dudes, Frankfurt Arsenal, you know, they were set up right next to the Stop the Bleed class and, you know, getting that face to face time with them talking about you know some of their products that we have and that we're looking at getting and stuff it's, it's just really cool oh yeah we had and, and your guest from last week uh jason from nedbed precision they were there with, yes. with a lot of their stuff and, uh, uh unfortunately badger they came and then were called away at the last minute um with uh with not an emergency but uh, an urgent uh an urgent appointment that came up so um, we, we kind of miss those guys, but uh, they, you know, they made the whole trip out there and then wound up having to leave at the last second. So, um, 
but yeah, we, we, you know, we definitely encourage uh, all of our sponsors to, you know, to come and have that physical presence at a match. Um, I think that does a lot for shooters to, to see, you know, the, the people at the matches and, and you know, like, Hey, I've got this Vortex product. And they're like, to, to see those people from Vortex there um, and with their table full of stuff and, and uh, answering questions and tips and tricks. And you know, you know, just because you can buy something doesn't really mean you know how to use it. The people that built it oftentimes know a lot about stuff that, that you may never have thought of. So uh, I find that in a, in a lot of the gear that I get, uh, the people that build that stuff really know what's up with it and can really kind of make your life easier. Agree on hundred percent. So, where do you see the Vortex Team Sniper Challenge five years from now? Oh, uh, you know, I hope it. I hope it continues to grow. Um, you know, I kind of want to keep it the same size. I, I think when you get you know too many teams in there, um, you, you kind of start losing losing that personal feel of the match um you know trying to do i've been kind of wary about trying to do too much you know i always want to make it cooler and i always want to make it more fun i always want to make the stages longer um, and more involved um, so being able to keep it uh keep it a small enough match that you know you know people and and um you have that that feel of a I don't know, kind of not not a unit, but that camaraderie from from Sniper Challenge folks um, that get there. You know, you go to these and you see some guys from around the country, and you see all these new faces, and that common interest uh, common interest thing, you know, goes a long way for this kind of stuff. But you know, we're definitely trying to attract uh, people from other disciplines. We've had some really high end PRS guys come and shoot, and some high end NRL guys come and shoot, and uh, did quite well. So. Uh, we definitely encourage those guys to come out and 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 give this give this aspect of long range shooting a try. But um, I definitely want to see this thing you know grow and and, and get bigger um, and you know just have more spectacular stages. <laughs> Did I lose you guys? All right, I thought I thought we lost the audio there for a second. I'm not sure if I am freezing for y'all, but y'all are freezing for me. Um, it may be my internet. I think I have kids watching a movie upstairs. So that might be part of my problem. Um, but <laughs> are there any more lives? <laughs> we are good on the lives. All right. Well, I think we can wind this down to shout outs then. Well, before before we get too gone, I, I did want to talk a little bit about the prize, uh, the, the cash payouts for the finale. So oh, that's right. We didn't. Yeah. yeah we, how do so, we, we skip that? I don't know. I don't know. I, I think I, I probably started talking about something unrelated. We got off on a tangent somewhere. It's probably my fault. But um, we're going to give away a, a good chunk of money um, that our generous sponsors have provided. Uh, so $40,000 total right now um, is, is the plan. So right now, first place team for the LERP division in the championship is going to be $8,000. Um, wow. troop, yeah, Trooper is going to be seven and Mechanized is going to be five for the first place. So and then it goes down from there. Eva, second place in LERP is going to be 5000 and third place is going to be 3000 so trooper goes down to 4,500 for second and 2,500 for third. And uh, mechanized is 5,000, 3,000, and 2,000. So it's going to be some good cash prizes available for this finale. Uh, and, you know, still great prize tables. Um, the prize table at the end is, you know, going to be bigger than the, the ones in the middle. But, um, and we're, we're excited about, uh, some really neat stuff that we're going to do at the finale as well that's going to be in in the stages and uh, make this a match that you really really don't want to miss so so now everybody wants to shoot the finale <laughs> yeah yeah well 
you know, everybody, everybody that, that, uh, everybody that qualified isn't going to be able to make it. So, you know, if you, if you, um, if you didn't qualify or if you qualified and your partner can't make it, there's still a chance, you know, if you've shot some of these other matches before you get preference and um, then there'll be some slots uh, maybe that come up for sale after those folks are gone. So uh, we'll have more on the schedule for that as, as to how many days in between uh, we've got the last two matches have like a month, almost exactly between them, but we've got about six weeks between the last match, the last qualifier in Utah and, um, the finale in Texas. So have a little more time there, but uh, start blocking out your calendar now. And uh, we hope to see you in one of these other two matches and in Texas. I think we need to revise your, uh, your list of who gets next pick at finale and have your, your favorite social media page people uh, be first. <laughs> well, then who's going to do all the social media page stuff? We'll outsource it to China. Okay. <laughs> Goodness gracious. I would, I, would love, I would love to see you guys shoot one of these. That is exciting, though, with having some money on the table, I think, um, adds another element of seriousness to it, you know. And it, oh, absolutely, it yeah. Really legitimizes the sport. I know y'all have done a ton of work to get the sponsorships and, and make the money to be able to do this for yeah. the competitors. So I think it's great. Absolutely, absolutely. Vortex really took the lead on on heading up a lot of the sponsorship stuff. Um, Nick, who was the was the co guest with me last time, um, you know, really really hit it out of the park with all of the sponsorship stuff. So we're um, really excited to be able to bring this level of return to the shooters. You know, uh, shooting these matches is expensive, and to be able to to be able to get a payout at the end for doing well, I think is, you know, something that the, the sport needs. And uh, I'm just super, super excited to be part of it. A lot of these teams have really put a lot of money into it because they've been shooting these team matches, you know, doing mammoth, doing different things, improving their skill sets. And um, so I think it's great to see them possibly be able to, you know, reap a little bit of what they sowed. Yeah, and I think that's only going to get better as this genre of matches becomes a little more mainstream, um, and we get you know we get more more people in it because there's there's no reason that your big high end PRS and NRL guys can't come out here and do really really well at this. They've already got uh, they've already got one of the big pieces figured out. Um, it's you know from there it's pretty much just logistics and fitness and. Um, you know that they've already got a leg up so we'd, we'd love to see more of those guys come out uh, and you know as always we started this for our, our military and law enforcement guys um, you know those are the guys that do this as a job and uh, we definitely always love to see them come out and do it you know they've got they've got a lot of the communication piece and a lot of the uh, the tactics piece down already so you know they've got a leg up in that respect so Definitely. Just, uh, you know, take what you've got and build on that. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of different, a lot of different careers and a little, a lot of different hobbies that could be really successful at this, at this, um, at this level. Uh, even your three gun guys, um, you know, there's a lot of pistol in these matches and uh, there's a lot of, a lot of quick movement and, and building, you know, getting in and out of position and, you know, three gun and USPSA people, you know, they, they've got the movement down. Um, so, you know, everybody, everybody that in the shooting sports has a little piece of this already in their arsenal. And they, you know, you just, just work at the work at building the skills that, um, that you don't have. And, uh, you know, it's, you can be really, really successful, especially if you've already got a leg up from one of the other sports. And, and you know, the same goes for your for your, um, your mountain hunter guys, um, Colorado's full of a lot of uh, backcountry guys that, that hunt at altitude and put in a lot of miles in a day. Um, so, you know, they've got a leg up in that respect. There's a lot, I feel like these are matches that someone could come in that um, maybe has some of the different skills and could come in and really do well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Look at our, our, you know, our, our little young three gun guys, they come in and knocked it out of the park on their first one. Um, you know, they, they struggled a couple of times with the, 
with the physical part. Um, you know, the, they're one of the greatest things I've ever seen at any of these matches. And this goes back to what you were talking about. Greg was a good story was, um, we were waiting and, uh, they, they didn't look like they were going to make the, the ruck time. And, uh, their mom was actually on the course and she was, she, you know, she was looking at her watch and looking down the road and waiting for them to come around the corner and they didn't. And so I was like, Oh man, I hope these guys make it. And as, as we were driving off, I could hear, the whole rest of the squad that was already finished, I could hear them start cheering and uh, start, you know, screaming encouragement. And as they got closer, you could hear the clapping and they crossed the finish line with, you know, just a few seconds to spare. And uh, the whole squad went nuts and you could, you could hear them through the woods. And I was like, I know what that sound is. Those guys, they actually, they made it. So um, that was great. I wish I'd been able to be there to see it. But even just hearing it through the woods was awesome. That that level of support from the from the other guys in the squad. So, but they, you know, no 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 real long range experience and and you know no no physical match type experience like this. Um, and they did really really well. Uh, based, you know, they they shot pistol well, um, and they they worked together well. So. And, you know, being that young, they're always eager to learn and, and, you know, they don't have as many bad habits to break and they don't have as much ego to, to try to, you know, beat each other up with. <laughs> so they, these guys are going to be awesome. They're going to, they're going to do really well. If they stick with this, they'll be, they'll be at the top of the game in short order. That's right. They might have time more too. Absolutely. Do we have any more lives, Greg? We are good on the live side of things. All right. I think that we covered everything now. Yeah, I think we got it. Um, so we'll start with you, Greg, for shout outs. All right. I have GSL suppressors, uh, shooters and sharpshooters of Augusta, our local indoor and outdoor ranges, PDC custom for the most beautiful rifle chassis known to man, shooters world powder, hunters HD gold. I'm super blind, but not when I wear those. They're awesome. They increase the contrast, so that gray will stand out a little bit better with your Hunter's HD Gold. Um, Fix-It Sticks and Vortec. Joe, what shout-outs you got? Uh, just, you know, all the great sponsors that, that, um, that, have, that have helped out with this match. And, uh, you know, first and foremost, Vortex. Um, you know, they've been the, the cornerstone for all of this and, and, you know, all the other assistance they've given with the, with the tents and the sponsorship and the, the, the support, the offsite support. Um, all my guys from North Carolina and Indiana that, that came out and helped build the match, um, John and Jeff and Toby, um, those guys have been huge for me uh, getting this stuff done. So, um, just just a really great community of folks um, that have come out and tried to you know help make this successful all, all of the sponsors from the, the the lowest level all the way up to the you know to the big dogs um, have really stepped in and, and made this amazing so we go and do coverage of these matches um, we've teamed up with joe and vortex to do coverage for these matches so um, if you are interested in seeing what they look like, look on our Facebook page or our YouTube and watch some of the videos to see some of the stages and kind of what it's like. We also try to put the sponsors in the videos so that you can see who is helping make this all possible. So um, you can kind of know who to thank for getting these series sponsored and, and letting them go and do and have the ability to have a cash prize at the end. Um, so definitely look at those and check those out. And Joe, tell us one more time if they want to register for Cameo on Saturday morning, what time and what the website is. So Saturday morning, the 21st of this month uh, at 9 a.m. Uh, and it's practicescore.com, practicescore.com. All right. So go to practice score and sign up for the match. Um, yeah, just, we, just search Vortex Sniper Challenge and it'll, it'll pop right up. Are y'all gonna put it on the, put a link on the Facebook page maybe that morning? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'll, 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 we'll get that up sooner than that, so. So there'll uh, be a link then, um, on the Vortex Team Sniper Challenge Facebook page 
So check that out and you can have a link there. Um, and then otherwise, I just wanted to shout you out, Joe, for I know how much work this is. I know that you actually have a real job, that this is not your job. You have a real job. Um, I do. You're a nurse like me, so I know that you're trying to juggle actually having a family and a career and doing these matches. I know it's a ton of work. I'm not sure that anyone really understands how much work it is. So huge shout out to you for just, you know, match directing these matches and doing them and, and making them possible. Well, I appreciate it. It's it's been a lot. It's been a lot of fun. Um, it's it's tough sometimes, and you know, but but overall, overall, it's great to see people having a good time and and uh, you know, getting better. That's you know, that's the thing. You want to make everybody better and uh, challenge people to to advance and and hone their skills and be better at this. And if we can if we can get um, any of these law enforcement or military guys. Uh, get them home safe and get their job completed uh, as expeditiously as possible. Um, then that's what we want to do. That's the, that's the main focus, but you know, it's been, it's been great to be able to, you know, all the support I've gotten from, from all the folks all around the industry and, and all the shooters coming up saying, Hey man, this is the most fun we've ever had. You know, you got to keep doing these. So we'll, we'll keep right on, keep right on trudging and, and, you know, bring them to as many places as we can. That's right. So everybody go register for the match Saturday morning um, and then get ready for the championship and the cash prizes. Put it on your calendars and check out the stages on the either the Shears Mindset Facebook page or the Vortex Team Sniper Challenge also has some of them on there. So and with that, it'll be a wrap for episode 376 and we'll see y'all in two weeks. All right. Take it easy.